The leg end of Zorba, instrument of a temporal nature, is a masterpiece. What else can I say about the game? When asked about his thoughts on the legend of Zoldon, Ocarina of Time, my neighbour said, Ocarina? I hardly know her. Ha! <laughs> I'm just goofing with ya. When I actually asked my neighbour's thoughts on Ocarina of Time, he said, If you don't get off my f***ing premises, I'm calling the popo! Anyway, I give Ocarina of Time 5 rose-tinted nostalgia-filled glasses out of 5. But I have something to disclose with you all. I grew up with this game, and as such, I am incredibly biased. Zelda Ocarina of Time came out at a time when I was just getting into gaming, and I regard it as the best game of all time, primarily because no other game has had a bigger impact on me. I simply cannot see the game as a newcomer would today, what with their Dark Souls and their Overwatches and their Fortnites. As such, I will always say it is 5 out of 5. But this score is just a number, and it doesn't say anything about how I feel about the game. I went back and played Ocarina of Time recently to get footage for this video and to understand why I love the game so much, and if I still feel the same way as an adult. So let me share with you why I love Zelda Ocarina of Time. And before I go any further, I'll be talking about the OG Nintendo 64 game, not the 3DS remake. What do I look like? A youngin? A hip and happening youth of today? Not likely. I'm an old man. I mean, how do you do, fellow kids? Let us move on, the door of time has opened. Oof, my pancreas. I love the Legend of Zelda series. I know that's probably an unpopular opinion amongst the hashtag gamers out there, hashtag gaming all the time, and it certainly wasn't my opinion back when my only two games were Super Mario 64 and Yoshi Story. One of these games revolutionised how movement felt in a 3D space and defined a genre of games for generations. And the other was Yoshi Story for the Nintendo 64. So I declared Super Mario 64 to be my favourite game and I certainly wasn't looking for any challenges to that throne. What, Nintendo were going to release another classic in 3D gaming? Surely lightning was not going to strike twice. And then, in the Christmas of 1998, we were at our family house when my cousin, from up the road, comes over with his Christmas gift for me, which is Zelda Ocarina of Time. I saw the classic Nintendo 64 box shape and I thought, pfft, it's probably not as good as Super Mario 64. Anyway, he put the game in the console and started playing while I sat on the floor and watched. The game starts as Young Link in the Kikiri Forest. It looks cool, I thought. Definitely different to Mario 64, but it's not like the best game of all time or whatever. And as my cousin explored, he found bridges spanning across the housetops. And then as he was running along one, he fell off. But Link didn't fall off the bridge. He does this reverse grab hold to keep himself up. And putting aside how completely impossible this is to do physically, seeing this completely blew my mind. It was this new animation that I hadn't seen in Super Mario 64, and as silly as it sounds, it opened up my mind to the possibility that, oh, perhaps this game could be better. And so after Christmas I played Ocarina of Time on a new save file, and the game absolutely floored me in what games could technically do, in how they played and how they made you feel. And it soon overtook Super Mario 64 and became my favourite and most cherished game of all time. And it all started in the world of Hyrule. Ocarina of Time blew everyone away in 1998 for various reasons, but the main factor was the world it presented to the player. It was absolutely huge for the time, with extremely varied landscapes and races that have now become iconic in the Zelda universe. Unlike the world of Super Mario 64, where each level is connected by a portal in Princess Peach's castle, the world of Hyrule is one continuous place with varied environments that smoothly transition, if one can call this thing a smooth transition. As you adventured to the tips of the map, you would come across the Domain of the Zoras, the City of the Gorons, Lake Halia, and the Gerudo Desert. And discovering each place for the first time was always breathtaking. breathtaking. Each new race of people had a unique look, and their homes, the Kakiri Forest, Goron City, Zora's Domain, and Gerudo Valley, all felt exotic and unique, and most importantly felt suited to each race. 
Obviously the fish people would have a lot of water around and a waterfall in their home. Obviously the Gorons would roll around the city. Obviously permanent forest children would live in trees with their tree dad. Obviously Hyrule Castle would have a lady that looks like this. Hyrule Castle Town was actually impressively full of life. And now it's time for a quick technical appreciation bonus question. How did they technically achieve this with the limited polygons on the Nintendo 64? These crowds are just two or three unified blocks. One unified pants block are the unified pants block. Celebrated everywhere for its technical savviness. And a jiggling unified chest block. There's two of them in fact. I know the pre-rendered background is a bit of a letdown, but I'd take that over the Silent Hill Castle Town from the beta version of the game. At least this looks like a bright and bustling capital, which was technically impressive for the time, and provided a startling contrast with the town seven years in the future. Thanks a lot, liberal government. This was the game that really solidified the varying races and their visual identity that will be used from here on in the series. Interestingly, some of their designs were linked to the limitations of the Nintendo 64, with Kokiri children disappearing in the distance, only visible by their fairy, Zora's disappearing under the water and only appearing as bubbles, and Goron's graciously reducing their vertex count by rolling up into a ball. But of all the races and places, the Gerudo in Gerudo Valley were my favorite, partly due to the music, partly due to being all women in cool rabbit clothes and jewel wielding scimitars like a bunch of bosses who don't give a flip. Although they do flip quite a lot. Gerudo Valley had an intense desert and this massive waterfall that connected to the equally massive Lake Hylia. And this combination, along with the same blue skybox shared across all maps, and I do literally mean a skybox, makes the world feel incredibly connected, more so than future Zelda titles other than Breath of the Wild, where the world is literally connected. Lake Hylia was huge but had interesting mini-games like that tree with the large claw marks that are never explained and add a sense of mystery to the world, and the farms with the scarecrows which give you a somewhat secret method of accessing even more hidden areas, and of course the fishing minigame which was surprisingly mechanically rich. Once you knew where the big fish was, you had to entice it either by wobbling the bait or pulling the line in, and once you got a bite you had to reel the line in as fast as you could and also pull the line in the opposite direction that the fish was fighting against. It felt like real fishing, says a man who has never fished in his life. Kakariko Village, the cemetery and Lon Lon Ranch are also places that I can list. Each with its own little secrets, such as gravestones with holes underneath, the towers at the back of Lon Lon Ranch, as well as skull tiles littered everywhere which encouraged investigating every corner of the map. And in every corner you'll find something, whether it's an interesting detail like the shark at the bottom of the pool in the ocean lab, or a hairy seller of bomb chews on his flying carpet over a sandpit in the desert or a heart piece, or a fairy fountain, or a bag upgrade, or a minigame, or a stage to show off your masks, or another minigame, or an NPC's home with his diary, or a shop, or a hidden passage that provides a nice view of the zone, and of course, as per Zelda tradition, hidden caves everywhere. It didn't feel like a video game world, everywhere felt real like an actual place lived in by people and full of secrets that I had stepped into, which really sold the feeling of an epic adventure. This world felt really fleshed out, which at the time was helped by the impressive visuals, although not by today's standards obviously. Now when saying that the graphics are important in a video game is a very shallow thing to say, especially when, by today's standards, they look like a rainbow puked up a collection of triangles. But at the time when achieving more and more realistic graphics was a big focus, if slightly misguided, of the industry, it was a big deal. And as a kid, what I saw in Ocarina of Time was impressive. Everything had far more detailed textures than I would seen before, and really sweet lighting effects. Even little touches like the day and night cycle or the light fairies in the forest were technically impressive and added to the world's authenticity. For instance, even Link's shadow was more complex than what I'd seen before, consisting of two leg shadows that rotated as Navi flew around Link. In a time when characters had a simple circle to signify their shadow, this was mind boggling. The lighting was especially moody in the cemetery and the Skull Tuller house, and this was before the expansion pack that doubled the Nintendo 64's memory and allowed for even fancier lighting effects. In another nice technical touch, these dynamic lighting effects were usually only true for Link, but also signposts. You know those signposts that can be cut into different sizes based on your sword swing, and whose pieces had their own physics, and could be healed with Zelda's lullaby? Yes, that sign had a dynamic shadow. Other things had a rudimentary dynamic shadow too, mainly Ganondorf, and the lighting for the final boss was so spectacular that not even the 3DS version could replicate it, making it the not very definitive edition. Even character models were impressive to me. Up until that point I had seen blocky people and relatively flat textures from Super Mario 64, but the graphics in Zelda blew me away, 
people seem more realistically proportioned despite actually being completely cartoonish in their proportions, which later Zeldas with their improved graphics made only more obvious. But Link in Zelda, heck, even Ganon looked cool and realistic. And not to forget Shake that manly man, god damn, he's so much man. Adult Link had his sweet white undershirt with two earrings which I thought was totally rad. Mario didn't have any earrings, that's for sure. Sure, Link didn't have any body parts under his tunic, but that didn't seem to faze any of the women who had a subtle romantic connection with him. It must be his personality. Or his master sword. Mamma Mia. And it wasn't just people, the monsters looked cool too. Sure, the keys weren't complicated model-wise, but everything larger had a very detailed appearance. Despite consisting of few polygons, the more detailed textures helped overcome this limitation. And along with the enemy movement and AI, they felt more real, more of a threat. And the bosses, oh. Even the early game bosses were large and impressive, although sometimes easy to take down. <coughs> King Tadongo. <coughs> Up until this point, these bosses were the biggest things I've seen in the game, and each one blew me away with its scale. Even to this day, I don't actually know what Bongo Bongo looks like, all I have is these panicked flashes of his appearance through the dark. Volvagia, even with only his head popping out of the ground, was bigger than Link, and his flashy fire hair made him very menacing. These bosses were impressive, they were threatening, and they suited the area they were in. Except Phantom Ganon, whose association with the Forest Temple always really confused me. Except even he had this cool phase of the fight where he rides out of a painting, before the obligatory match of energy tennis happens. 30 love, motherfucker. Ah shit, 30 15. In fact, every boss in the game was extremely memorable and visually stunning. And now for something completely different. Ocarina of Time had two side quests that really helped the world feel vast and varied, but also very connected at the same time. In Castle Town is Shigeru Miyamoto, posing as the Happy Mask Salesman, who, before acquiring a demon mask from hell in another dimension, sells you a variety of less demony masks. Luckily, there is one and exactly one person in the world wanting each individual mask, and selling them the mask might make you gain or lose some rupees. But it's no biggie smalls, as rupees are never an issue, if you know where to look. Completing this quest makes available a mask of the Gorons, the Zora, and the Gerudo, as well as the Mask of Truth, a mask that allows you to speak to Stones of Truth, as well as to hear what people are thinking. Instead of flattening them like a pancake, or sending them to space, these stones can tell you strange little abstract bits of lore, increasing the mystery of the world. Which, dare I say, sounds a bit like Dark Souls. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. The other masks don't have any specific use other than hearing what people say in response to them, but even here there is world building. For instance, Malon's mum and Talon's wife, possibly being Nobu. After all, the Gerudo do ride to Hyrule to look for boyfriends. And who would make a better boyfriend than a bolder, fatter Super Mario? It's a me, babe. Wahoo! The other side quest is the dreaded trading quest, which gets you swapping increasingly bizarre items to NPCs all over the map, later with a time limit requiring you to physically travel the game world, as warping causes the time to drop to zero. This quest lets you the Begoran Sword, double damage and greater range at the expense of not being able to use your shield. But what is nice about the quest is the stories and the lives that it intersects. A man in the forest, the Kaku lady's brother, and the carpenter's son, who was a constant disappointment for his father. We've seen him bum around Kakariko at night, now he'll likely get lost in the forest and turn into a Stalfos. Or how about waking up Talon after Ingo took his ranch when Ganondorf took power, helping him reunite with his daughter. Or conversing with the biggest mother freaking Goron that ever existed. Or giving this guy a reason to exist in the game. These side quests really help the world feel alive, like a home for all these polygonal people. In all this talk of the game's world, I've neglected to mention Hyrule Field. All of the criticisms of it, mainly that it's mostly empty, is factually true. It is mostly empty. But give me Hyrule Field any day of the week over the Great Sea or above the clouds. I just find walking and rolling with Link on his tootsies more mechanically interesting than sailing a bird or riding a boat. I have more control. Plus, there's the option of using a fast amount with a Pona later in the game. Short traveling this field mainly consisted of going from one place to another, typically following a straight path through nothing in particular. But the limited space of the Nintendo 64 actually works to its advantage, as although the field is large, particularly for its time, you can roll across it in three minutes, whereas the Great Sea and above the clouds are much larger, hence the lack of landmarks and content sticks out as a larger sore thumb. Hyrule Field has landmarks all over the place for the player to explore, like this little peak near Kakariko, or the rocky area leading to the Gerudo Valley, and these weird little corners of the earth here, protected by these crazy helicopter enemies. There are a few areas of the map that are a bit odd, places that you never go as a player. But they exist anyway, like this area west of Hyrule Town, where the town's water flows out. These spaces feel fantastically liminal, increasing my fascination with Hyrule. 
and making the field feel like a real place, more than the very designed feel of Terminator Field with its four geometric quadrants. These areas had many trees and rocks, urging the player to bomb everything, looking for secret coves. Oh, when I worked out there were bombable holes in Hyrule, I went crazy. Any cracks? Bacham! Fairy fountain. And if a player is perceptive enough, they can find unique areas of the map, sometimes without any items up there, which made the world feel very mysterious. Now let me talk about this little area in Hyrule Field. It is a vestigial, weird little bit of land separated by water in an isolated corner of the map. At least it is on paper. But when I knew there were secrets, even this part felt brimming with potential secrets. That's why I bombed it to Kingdom Come. That's the signal! Go, 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 go! The reason why I mention this area at all is that I think it really captures how I feel about Ocarina of Time. It doesn't look like much, and there's not much there to do, but I still carpet bombed it like I was the pyrotechnician working on the set of Apocalypse Now. And that is a testament to how much wonder I had in this world, that a secret could always be around the corner, and even a meaningless area like this had so much potential. When I think of Ocarina of Time, the meat and potatoes of this game are the dungeons. Each dungeon felt varied and unique, and I feel had some of the best puzzles and gameplay of the whole Zelda series. Of the games that I've played, that is. As much as I love Breath of the Wild's world, i.e. the wild, the dungeon design was very singular. The shrines felt too small scale, although they were relieved by the divine beasts with their massive manipulative structure, making you think of the dungeon as a whole, rather than as one or more puzzles occurring in series. However, the Divine Beasts and all the Shrines had the same visuals and sound, resulting in everything feeling the same and forgettable. Whereas in Ocarina of Time, I find each dungeon was extremely memorable. Now this could be due to nostalgia, I think Majora's Mask's dungeons step up the dungeon design from Ocarina of Time to even crazier heights in four huge complex dungeons, but I have a greater difficulty remembering these dungeons just due to my reduced familiarity with that game. But the dungeons in Ocarina of Time had to introduce what Zelda dungeons could be in 3D, and it really excelled. Nostalgia or not, these dungeons benefited from well-designed combat encounters, puzzles and set pieces, which is what makes them timeless. The three dungeons you encounter as a child really set the tone for what to expect, training the player with 3D dungeon exploration and preparing them for the adult dungeons. But they were no less memorable in their own right. For instance, the first dungeon involves you entering the mouth of a tree. That's pretty flippin' memorable. This dungeon introduces many mechanics built on in later dungeons, including lighting torches with Deku Sticks, hitting ice switches, as well as time switches. Importantly, it gets players to think about the third dimension, and the structure of the dungeon as a whole, with one puzzle requiring players to use gravity to break a web to progress. The Dongo's Cavern introduces bombable walls and gets you accustomed to the arc of throwing bombs in 3D, and stands out with some tense encounters with Lizalfos on platforms in lava, easily the toughest combat encounter up until this point. Inside Jabu Jabu's belly reinforces the use of switches, in this case tentacles, for progression, but remains unique thanks to its appearance and textures, making you feel like you are inside a creature. Swinging a sword into the wall no longer clangs, instead you swing it and hear a wail as the wall shakes. Not to mention you have to chaperone Princess Ruto through part of the dungeon, which was not troublesome as she was invulnerable, thankfully. All the bosses in this childhood stage are very intimidating too, although not necessarily difficult when you know what you're doing. I like how Goma's attack when she drops babies can be interrupted by the slingshot. I like how King Dodongo rolls into the lava when he's taken down. He's like, ah, oh, fuck it. And the fight with Baronade I really enjoy, weaving through jellies with my boomerang aimed and dodging jets of electricity. Most of the time. He dies in a cool way too. Hmm, gross. But it's the adult dungeons that will make you grow some hair on your chest and or testicles. Now let me gush about the forest temple for a little bit. It's my favourite dungeon, mainly due to its aesthetic with vines everywhere and from the rumbling and occasional instrument twangs, it really sets me off edge going through the dungeon. It had some fantastic set pieces such as the twisting hallway, the room with the falling ceiling, and the central aim of retrieving the Poe flames to activate the elevator, which after doing that led to another cool set piece with a rotating room. There is a specific room in this temple with a poison pool, rotating platforms, a torch and an eye target frozen in ice. You could shoot the ice with a fire arrow, which you are unlikely to have at this stage of the game, or you could use Din's fire, or you could shoot a normal arrow through the torch fire, hitting the eye. This is essentially a preliminary foundation of the interacting systems that Breath of the Wild would popularise. The programmers did not account for only one solution. You were given the aim of melting the ice, and anything with a fire property will work. 
That's why hitting keys with fire doesn't kill them, but adds the fire property to them, making them fire keys. Speaking of which, my memories of the fire temple are a ridiculous amount of fire. Lava floors, firewall maze, moving fire jets, fire jets from statues, bats on fire. It had some interesting set pieces, the boulder maze and the mini boss with the fire dancer which was wonderfully weird. And the overarching goal of rescuing Goron strongly linked this dungeon with the overarching story of Ganon's rule impacting Hyrule. It has a looping design where falling from high rooms will bring you back to early rooms. And at one of the tippy top rooms is the Megaton Hammer, the item for this dungeon. And the other, I would guess 95% of people wouldn't see, as you would need the Scarecrow song to access. The fact that dungeons had little side routes like this, not necessary for progression, filled them with such mystery and made them feel like actual dungeons. Okay, what can I say about the Water Temple? People hate it, I think it's okay. It's aesthetically beautiful, particularly in the main room where the light reflects off the water and dances on the walls. Unfortunately, it is limited by inventory management, slowing down, changing Link's boots, something that happens many times in this temple. But it requires a lot of spatial awareness of the dungeon in 3D space, knowing how changing water levels will help you access different areas on different levels. It had many cool set pieces. The room with the whirlpools, the other room with the whirlpools, the waterfall with the platforms, and let's not forget the room with the whirlpools. And the dungeon music felt suitably serene but deadly, and it had arguably the coolest set piece in the game. The fight with Dark Link, which had an awesome setup. You run across a large room with water on the ground, seeing Link's reflection. There are no walls in the room, but you can see a door sitting in isolation not too far away, so you head for that door, and pass a little island on the way. Now you might notice that your reflection disappears after the island, but probably not. And when you reach the door, it's locked, so you turn around and... Wait, is that a person standing on the island? Unlike the water dungeon that requires you to know the structure of the dungeon to progress, the Shadow Temple might be the easiest adult dungeon due to its linearity. However, it too has a very unique, creepy, undead aesthetic, which is helped by the gauntlet of swinging sides, massive guillotines, fake walls, as well as invisible and not so invisible traps. The creepiness is further enforced by the many fights with the Stalfos, including a really cool set piece with two Stalfos on a death ship floating down a death canal. And that was after the spooky section with invisible walls and skulls telling me Hyrule's bloody history of greed and hatred. Not only is this great world building that creates a lot of mystery in the world that cannot be fully answered, it is fantastic dungeon theming. In my opinion, the best theming of all 3D Zelda games, including Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, although that is not much of a challenge. And the final dungeon, the Spirit Temple, had a really sweet desert aesthetic. It had some puzzles involving deflecting light, culminating in a cool set piece where you melt the face of a statue with light. And it had both child and adult sections, resulting in two cool combat encounters with the Dark Knuckles. And this doesn't include the mini dungeons, including the ice cavern, which had a ridiculous amount of ice, including falling ice, freezy ice breath, ice blocks and ice balls, and ice enemies that in a nice touch would break into chunks if you hit them, but melt if you used a fire attack on them. There was Under the Well, which had some really creepy rooms with reed heads, hands coming out of acid, tortured devices with blood, and plenty of invisible chests and openings requiring you to comb over it with the lens of truth. And I'm not going to mention the combat encounter with the mini hands in the ground twisted face monster. I'm not. I'm just not going to mention it. Like, at all. An optional area where you could pick up the ice arrows was the Gerudo Training Ground, which uniquely had a number of rooms with independent challenges, all providing a small key to the player. And then you must use the small keys in this maze of locked doors, presenting different paths to the treasure. And that treasure is... The Ice Arrows. I just mentioned it moments ago. Just a pop quiz to see if you're all still awake. I mean, my voice isn't that nice, so I don't expect anyone to have fallen asleep to this video ASMR style. And the final dungeon was Ganon's Castle, which was the best last level of any game I can think of. It has a great aesthetic with a black castle and the gauntlet style dungeon where you have to complete a series of mini dungeons for each of the adult dungeons, which was great. It felt like this final trial was the summation of everything you have achieved to that point. You get to briefly encounter the sages again as they help remove the barrier protecting the inner sanctum. This allowed access to the central spiral staircase, which kept going and going and was interspersed with several combat encounters with increasing enemy difficulty culminating in an iconic fight with both a black and a white iron knuckle. A fitting final dungeon. <laughs> One cool part of the adult dungeon specifically was what happens on either side of the dungeon. That sounds weird, but let me explain. Before each dungeon, you run into Shake, who is a mysterious dude who is definitely a dude, and who says even more mysterious things which feel like they have a lot of meaning imbued in them. These scenes have a great cinematic quality and great dialogue. Her, I mean his purpose is to teach you a song on the ocarina, allowing you to warp to each dungeon easily. 
Then once you completed the dungeon, you were whisked off to the beautiful sacred realm to have a brief chat with the sage of that temple and receive a medallion. Both the scene with Sheik and with the sage afterwards really tied the player succeeding in the dungeon to the story. Not to mention sometimes you were treated to the world recovering after the dungeon is completed, whether it is Death Mountain's fiery halo disappearing or Lake Hylia filling up. Which is important as many Zelda games have dungeons with little pomp and circumstance. They're just there so that Link can get his one of seven MacGuffins in the end, reducing the feeling of importance around the dungeons. Breath of the Wild succeeds in emphasizing the importance of these dungeons with the four unique set pieces required to access the Divine Beasts, and once completed, the Divine Beasts laser beam targeting Calamity Ganon remains as a permanent grand marker of your progress. But ultimately, I feel Ocarina succeeds the most in the series in both its dungeon design as well as its integration with the story, making these dungeons feel extremely memorable and extremely important. Koji Kondo's soundtrack for Ocarina of Time is timeless, dare I say, legendary? Music is very important in the game, both musically, stay with me, and mechanically. First of all, it just sounds great to my ear holes. Starting off in the forest, the tune has a sense of childhood energy, perfectly representing both the childlike Kokiri and the Skull Kids in the Lost Woods. The Hyrule Field theme has a fantastic sense of adventure to it, and perfectly captures the journey of Ocarina of Time, despite straying from the traditional overworld theme from A Link to the Past, which Majora's Mask brought back for Terminal Field. Zora's theme was as serene as its aesthetics. Goron City had this goofy ooh, 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 that suited them so well. <laughs> and of course, Garuda Valley is my favourite track from a video game ever, period, full stop, end of sentence. The amazing music in Hyrule contrasted with the eerie ambience and disconcerting sounds of the dungeons. I already mentioned the forest temple, but they all succeed in putting the player on edge and making them feel like they are in a dangerous place. The Fire Temple had great ambience, even more so with the Islamic chant patched out in later versions of the game. The Water Temple music felt serene, yet deadly. And this culminates with Ganon's Tower, where you hear an ominous organ theme that gets louder as you ascend, only to find... But of course, the music was not just a passive feature of the game, the ocarina was pivotal, which for you detectives at home is subtly hinted at by this word here in the title of the game. You get two ocarinas in this game, the first from Saria, your childhood friend when you leave the forest to go on your adventure, but that shit gets quickly replaced by the actual ocarina of time later in dramatic fashion when Ganon chases Zelda out of Castle Town and she chucks it in the water. Both mechanically function the same, allowing the player to play five notes using the four C buttons and the A button on your controller to form simple songs. During the game you learn songs, which you as the player had to memorize and play with the instrument. That's right, you had to mechanically play the instrument. Unlike other games in the series, <coughs> Skyward Sword, <coughs> motion control bullshit. <coughs> and again, Ocarina of Time surprises with its mechanical complexity. Other than the five notes, you can make them sharp or flat with Z or R, moving the control stick left or right increases or decreases the notes by one, and moving the control stick even adds vibrato, whatever that means. You can play full songs on the ocarina. I mean, I can't, but the important thing is that you can. Playing songs was very important for the game. Zelda's lullaby, other than being a beautiful and iconic melody, was necessary to access new areas to progress. Other songs would help you change the time of day, make it rain, make blocks of time disappear, or to call your horse, or to do this, whatever this is. The songs you learn as an adult act to directly warp you to each adult temple, or that part of the world in general. 
and these warp songs are mostly classics. Minuet of the Forest, Requiem of Spirit, and The Prelude of Light were my favourites. The musical misses in comparison that were The Bolero of Fire, Serenade of Water, and The Nocturne of Shadow were not even that bad. In fact, all the Ocarina songs ranged from great to iconic, with Zelda's lullaby, Saria's song, Epona's song, and even the Song of Time all being at the top of the spectrum. All of these songs conveyed so much emotion, from their relevance to the story to the actual tune itself. Even to this day, these songs twang at my emotional strings and my nostalgia. I'm not a musical person at all. I don't know my do's from my so's, and Ray, I've got no fucking idea. Add on top of that, that my right hand is disabled. A tidbit about myself that for some reason I only bring up in Zelda videos, so sorry about that. So I wouldn't have dreamt of playing two-handed instruments like the piano. But the simple themes from Ocarina of Time made me want to play the piano, one-handed, to learn these tunes. In fact, playing these songs on the Nintendo 64 controller acted as rehabilitation for me in some ways, helping me develop my fine motor finger control that has benefited me to this day. And now, 24 years later, I am playing these melodies on the piano with my children. And I can't think of a better compliment for the music than that. There is a man you might have heard of. His name is Arnold G. Hansen, CEO of Grump Corp. He goes by the internet name Ego Raptor, or Video Game Boy, and along with his partner, Mr. Business, runs a YouTube channel called The Game Grumps. He has some controversial opinions of Ocarina of Time that are completely and utterly valid criticisms of the game. His main complaint is that the game, and I quote, has so much goddamn waiting. You are waiting for the slow text speed to progress. You are waiting to progress through Kaepera Gabra's speech, especially if you accidentally hear it again. You are waiting for King Zora to move his fine ass. But his most interesting comment is that the combat involves a lot of waiting. Think of the Stalfos with the shields, which are up most of the time, and combat involves waiting for them to move and become vulnerable. Needless to say, I didn't have this problem with the combat, but I can see where he is coming from. Combat does involve a lot of waiting, often for enemies to drop their guard for a split second. If you think about the mechanics of combat in Ocarina of Time, attacking with a weapon, shielding, Z-targeting, strafing and dodging, does that sound similar to any other video game series? Zero points for getting this as a ton of other videos have made this comparison, and it was in the title card. Yes, Dark Souls combat has these elements. However, combat in Dark Souls feels like an evolution of the combat in Ocarina of Time. It too involves waiting, not that the player really notices. And why is this? Well, I think it's because combat in Dark Souls, to a greater extent, forces the player to make decisions. For instance, there is stagger and poise and stamina management, systems that Ocarina of Time didn't have at all, which introduced their own questions to the player. Stagger affects player choice around armor sets and movement before combat even starts. Then with stamina management, mid-combat the player must decide whether to keep their shield up at the expense of reduced stamina regeneration, or to leave themselves vulnerable to get faster stamina regeneration. Not to mention Dark Souls has a greater variety of enemies who have a greater variety of attacks, each with different hitboxes. This forces the player to always focus on the enemy patterns to see when they will attack and what kind of attack it is. On top of that, should the player dodge out of the way or try to parry, which is riskier but has a better payoff. Not to mention that the difficulty is greater in Dark Souls. Even starting enemies can take a chunk of your health off, putting added pressure on those decisions. Dark Souls asks more questions of the player, which are more complex, and the punishment for poor choices is far greater. This makes the combat in Dark Souls more intense and engaging than Ocarina of Time. Therefore, while Ocarina of Time has most of the same decisions, it feels far easier as the AI is far simpler and the consequences for bad decisions is far less punishing. And so the waiting feels more obvious to the player. And that's where these criticisms of the combat stem from. But I think that's a slightly unfair comparison to make. There has been so much time and technical advancement between the two games. It will be a bit like comparing medieval surgery to modern medicine. Would Lord Ego Raptor of the House Grump complain after getting treatment for the flu that there's so many bloody leeches? Yes, in fact, we all would. Because we have experienced modern medicines and antibiotics. But I also don't want to shit on the combat in Ocarina of Time because it succeeded in feeling great at a time when the kinks of 3D action-adventure combat were still being worked out. Combat was easily readable, there were audio and visual cues when Link got hurt, and satisfying audio cues and flashes when you landed an attack, including a super satisfying screen flash with hit stun when you down an enemy, preventing it from feeling off and floaty like other 3D action games of the time. Items too were easy to use in 3D and felt experientially equivalent to how they feel like in future Zelda titles. Just another thing that Ocarina of Time nailed on its first try. 
In fact, Ocarina of Time uses the same system the original Zelda did. There are too many items and not enough buttons, so players had to assign equipment to different buttons on the fly. For the NES, it was the A and B buttons that could be programmed. In Ocarina of Time, it is the lower three C buttons, which is a maximum for the series. Wind Waker and Twilight Princess had three again, and Skyward Sword, I don't remember what the fuck that game did, until Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom removed it completely, resulting in players constantly stopping combat to bring up a menu and select a different weapon. But here in Ocarina of Time, selecting your three favourite or most useful items results in less menu management and improved the flow of gameplay and combat. Dark Souls did this too, but with four options across left and right hands, and again more slots for items and magic. Dark Souls also had autosave, along with many modern games, shown by an icon in the lower corner of the screen. Now I'm not going to tell you that Ocarina of Time had autosave, because it didn't, but Ocarina of Time kind of fucking had autosave bro. Saving was linked to exiting the menu, pressing B would bring up the option to save the game, and it was one button pressed either way, and saving was lightning fast, resulting in me saving every time I closed the menu. Effectively auto-saving the game, because bringing up those menus is kind of something you do a lot. Add to this that the AI behaviour in Ocarina of Time was revolutionary. Early on in the game, enemies are stationary, allowing the player to get accustomed to attacking and defending. But even then, they teach the player about timing, when attacks won't land with the Skull Tullers, and when enemies can be critically damaged with the Deku Bubbers. It conveyed to the player that timing was everything, and that was when shit stayed still. For instance, the Dodongo Lizards early in the game were very mobile. They jumped out of the way of your attacks and took multiple hits to down. Later on, the Skeletons had similar behaviour, but now they were able to shield attacks. Wait just a gosh darn second, are you telling me these enemies can block and jump over my head? To me, these were interesting fights, encouraging the player to perform a range of dodges and attacks, as well as waiting for the correct time to attack. In the right position, you could sneak in some attacks around their shield. Not to mention, items could give you an advantage, particularly Deku Nuts, which would freeze an opponent, allowing for a free hit. Waiting was usually optional, and what Link could do in combat was just as revolutionary. It was inspired by a Japanese sword fighting technique called Chambara, which translates to sword fighting. You're welcome. You can swipe horizontally and vertically, and stab, and jumping strike. I almost feel I don't need to mention Z-targeting, which was introduced in Ocarina of Time, to allow the player to track a moving enemy in 3D space. It was revolutionary, and became the standard for 3D action adventure games, such as Dark Souls. Being one of the first games to introduce this, it went hard with providing a narrative reason for it. Just like how the camera was personified in Mario 64, Z-targeting was personified with Navi, who zooms to Z-targetable objects, changing her colour based on if it was an enemy, or an NPC, or a hint. And locking on led to these large rotating triangles to track the target, and I just love how easily readable this is. Combined with the sound effect locking on, and the movie bars focusing the player's attention. Even in Dark Souls sometimes, with all the mess that is happening on screen, I can get lost on who my target is. Although sometimes, the movie bars do crop out the action. Z-targeting allowed Link to perform side jumps and backflips, i.e. dodge, which look cool aesthetically but were arguably not overly useful. Z-targeting with the bow and arrow also allows for trick shots, which are completely unnecessary, but very cool. So each fight in Ocarina of Time may not be as intense or as complicated as in Dark Souls, but decisions were required by observing the enemy and choosing when to block, move, dodge and attack. At least, it was not complicated for most enemies in the game. However, a notable exception, and where Ocarina of Time approaches the intensity and engagement of Dark Souls combat, in my opinion, is with the Iron Knuckles. These enemies are one of the toughest in the game, which adds that pressure to the player to make the right decision. Furthermore, in these battles, dodging moves was completely necessary as they attack through your shield. You had to know their attacks in order to dodge them effectively, and they only had two, but at least he's slow and... Oh shit, he's fast! It was a shame that there were only a few fights with these guys in the game, and they all came towards the end. As a person without the nostalgia, it might be easy to see all the flaws in Ocarina's combat without seeing much of the benefits, as what it did well has been done better in other games that came out later. However, it was the mechanics that Ocarina of Time revolutionised, for the first time in 3D gaming no less, that formed the basis for future games. Ocarina of Time walked so that Dark Souls could run. <laughs> People commonly argue that the story in Ocarina is quite simple, especially compared to the darker story of Majora's Mask. But I would ask, is it really? Let's look at the main story on a surface level, and before I go any further, here is your obligatory spoiler warning. You are a child growing up with other kids in the forest, but you are different, an outcast, because you don't have a fairy. You are summoned to action by the Deku Tree, who is kind of like a father figure, and he provides Link his own fairy, which is Navi. 
He dies due to the curse from Ganon, who, for those of you playing at home, is the rude, crude, evil dude, pushing Link to leave the forest. You must cross Hyrule Field and sneak into the castle to meet Princess Zelda, where you both decide to use the Triforce to deal with Ganon. Link then needs to go around Hyrule, combating the encroaching evil, and he is rewarded for defeating this evil with spiritual stones which act as the keys to the door behind which the Triforce lies. With all keys in hand, he attempts to get the Triforce, and the game throws its first curveball as Ganon gets the upper hand, gets the Triforce, while Link is trapped for seven years. He emerges as an adult seven years later into a Hyrule where Ganon and his darkness have taken over. With the aid of a manly man named Shake, Link travels to even more extreme ends of Hyrule, vanquishing darkness and fighting sages in a last ditch effort to seal Ganon away. Near the end of his quest, in another awesome twist, Shake is revealed to be Zelda, who is a woman and not a man, but then is immediately kidnapped in a far less awesome twist, forcing a confrontation with Link and Ganon in Ganon's castle, where Link slays Ganon with a master sword and they escape his crumbling castle. When this is all over, Princess Zelda sends Link back to his own time, seven years ago. And then, back as a child, Navi inexplicably flies away. Now, I don't think the surface level story in Ocarina of Time is particularly amazing by modern standards, but it tells its story extremely well. And it tells it with cinematic cutscenes that hadn't really been done previously in games at that point in time. Right from the opening menu, Ocarina of Time can't help but be iconic, legendary, and other adjectives with Link and Epona travelling through an empty Hyrule field at various times of day. Pretty soon after, the game throws a cool scene at us where we fly around the starting forest as Navi, looking at what she sees, which I find endlessly enjoyable. The first animation of the three gods creating the different elements of the world blew me away. Yes, it was exposition, but it was cinematic and technically impressive, and it really helped build the lore and the depth of the world. Cutscenes were used sparingly, but to great effect. Any instance of Shake and Link interacting is a standout, both from an animation and a shot composition point of view. Cutscenes of Darunia dancing and hitting Link on the head were comically well done. Princess Rudo messing with Link in the water after completing Jabby Jabby's belly. The scene where Link meets Princess Zelda for the first time. Even blowing up the Hyrule gravestone with the lightning were all extremely well done and conveyed the story well enough to drive the player on their journey. What is fantastic about the story of Ocarina is that the world is constantly changing in response to it, making it front and center in the player's mind. The way it does this is intertwined with the time travel mechanic. Firstly, I am a sucker for time travel stories, Back to the Future is my favourite film of all time, and the way that this story uses time travel with the game mechanics blew me away. As Kid Link, the adventure feels light and adventurous with a tinge of danger in the dungeons. But you get a sense of the power of Ganon, especially with the death of the Deku Tree at the onset of Link's journey, but ultimately it kind of feels like two kids just playing around. But when Ganon gets the upper hand, you are thrown into a bleak future that you were trying to prevent as a kid. You have failed, and you feel that straight away. You see the eruptions from Death Mountain straight after leaving the temple. You later find Zora's domain frozen over. Lake Hylia is drained. Evil spirits have been released in Kakariko, and monsters are in the Kakiri Forest. All this shows the player the strength of Ganon, once again driving the player to defeat him, which you do slowly as an adult, with each dungeon writing part of the world vanquishing those monsters, saving the Gorons, filling Lake Halia. All these changes following the completion of an adult dungeon really made the player feel like that they were writing the world, which was such a huge sense of accomplishment. Only the Zoras remained frozen in ice at the end of the game, which always struck me with a sense of oddness and sadness that I couldn't save them. Many side quests were also woven into the time travel mechanic. Planting beans as a child to use the flying plants as an adult, the battle of Lon Lon Ranch ownership between Mario and Luigi, and who could forget the music box player who caused a cyclical time loop. That's for complaining about me in the future. Even cool little parallels like the post seller in the future most likely being the castle guard stationed in that very room who wanted Link to break some pots to see some action. It was little stories like this that made the time travel feel useful and important, but its main use in showing the player an alternate dark version of the places I had seen fundamentally appealed to me. This is of course a similar mechanic as the light and dark worlds in A Link to the Past, However, execution in this game is better in my opinion, as it sets you up as protector of Hyrule, making the revelation of the Dark World more impactful as the world that you once knew was corrupted by darkness, and you played a part in that occurring. Accompanied by the physical change in Link himself, it signifies to the player that they too must grow, to take on tougher challenges ahead to accomplish their original goal. And indeed, the gameplay in the adult phase of the game reflects this, they present more difficult challenges in darker environments. Okay, I'm going to come out and say it. Some people hate Navi. Do I think she's a meme? Yes. Do I think that's unfair? Yes. 
Do I agree with the sentiment that she's super annoying? Yes. She gets my goat because she interrupts quite frequently about things that I already know about. Jesus Navi, I've played this game 20 times already. I know how to open doors. Thanks. But in defense of Navi, she's important for both the gameplay function, allowing the player to determine what they've said targeted to, and she and the fairies in general are important for world building around the Kokiri children, a point which will come up soon. And she's her own character, with an arc, a point that will definitely come up soon. But most importantly, she single-handedly propels the game story along, as a lost player can resort to her any time and get hints of where to go. I know where to go now, but in my first playthrough and for new players, she is an invaluable resource for navigating through the world. I remember asking her hints when I first played as a small child, and unlike Saria who could be a bit cryptic, she often gave a straightforward direction to the next story progression. She said, hey listen, but unlike the aforementioned door thing, she doesn't actually get in your way most of the time. Talking to her is completely optional. And not to mention, she even says a short, helpful snippet about every enemy and boss in the game. And it's this part of the video where I twist the dialogue to shamelessly gush about the ending of the game. Firstly, the Shake Zelda twist was rad and iconic. This revelation to the player, suddenly he was the princess that didn't suffer from Peach Syndrome. She kicked some butt in a ninja costume. I feel like this is the best incarnation of a strong independent Zelda. Tetra got off to a good start in Wind Waker, right up until she realised she was Zelda, and her entire personality changed as awkwardly as her skin colour. Even Zelda from Breath of the Wild suffers from a lack of inner strength. She depended so much on Link, and when watching each memory, me and my wife were rolling our eyes at how she behaved. But even then, like immediately after this reveal, she got captured by Ganon. Oh well, we can't have everything I suppose. And speaking of cinematic cutscenes, the one with Ganon, who starts off playing the organ that you've been hearing as you've been ascending the tower, was so good. And yes, the boss then devolved into Magic Tennis, but when you get him, he then tries to collapse the castle and you and Zelda have to race against time to get out alive. I couldn't believe that as a kid, after defeating Ganondorf, he would then make me have to escape his crumbling castle. But I did, with my heart in my throat. And then there was a noise. What does the game want from me now? In an epic cutscene, Ganondorf bursts out of the rubble, breathes heavily and transforms into Ganon. Then he knocks the Master Sword out of Link's hand. Here is the scene, Link's without a sword, facing a pig demon in the rubble of the castle, surrounded by fire, in the dark with only occasional lightning providing brief illumination. I have only one word to describe this. Epic. And it was done better in the original too, the fight was way too illuminated in the 3DS remake. When I first fought Ganon, I ended up dying before I had to go out to do something with my family. And while we were doing whatever that was, my mind was racing over the battle, shocked that there was another form. If I killed Ganon, was there an even bigger form called Gan? Or G? G unit? But defeat him you do, in an epic and bloody way, sealing Ganon away and ending the game. Here, Ocarina of Time once again outperforms its successes with a final battle, as multi-phase final boss battles in future Zeldas have been arguably overused. <coughs> Twilight Princess! <coughs> but here it felt just right. Each phase had a drive behind it, and not just, oh he's got another form. At the end of the game, Link and Zelda say goodbye to each other in the clouds. As a player, I wanted him and Zelda to be together from this point. But Zelda says to Link that he missed out on all this time, 7 years, and so using the ocarina, she sends him back to live out that time that he deserves. And then the credits roll, and the player's accomplishments are then reinforced with a cutscene that plays behind. All of the people and races that you have helped are shown together, partying at Lon Lon Ranch. It's a reward and recognition of the player's actions. It feels as if you truly helped the people of this world. Towards the end of the scene, the sages are up on a mountain looking down, still there, but forever out of reach. And here is where more melancholy leaks in. As the sages are people you know, most of them you met as a child seven years ago. You have developed bonds with them, were close friends, sworn brothers, fiancés. But in order to become sages of the sacred realm to seal Ganon away, they can no longer be a part of this world. They sacrificed their lives to protect Hyrule, and they transform into stars in the sky. I remember feeling both sadness and melancholy seeing this ending as a child. But approaching this story as an adult, there is a level of tragedy and loss that I completely missed. A tragedy that I began to see after reading the brilliant Immortal Childhood article, or the fantastic video Ocarina of Time, a masterclass in subtext, for an insight. Let me explain. In the final moments of the game, we see Link back in the Temple of Time as a child, where Navi, for some reason, leaves Link and flies towards the window. Remember, Navi joined him back when he thought he was a Kokiri without a fairy, and has been with him throughout this whole journey. But Link is of course not a Kokiri, but a Hylian. 
Not that he fits in with the other Hylians who comment on his green clothes and call him Fairy Boy. We later learn that Hylians who get lost in the Kokiri forest without a fairy become Stalfos. So in the beginning of the story, Link is an outcast, and upon the death of his father figure, he explores another world that treats him like an outcast. While he is thrust into adulthood, inside he is still mentally and emotionally a child. A child in an adult's body. But when confronted with a menacing world, he is forced to grow up fast. And with each completed dungeon, he gains a spiritual sage but loses a personal relationship, lost to the flow of time. And while we can briefly interact with them back as a child, as an adult the sages are absent, doing their duty to protect the sacred realm. These losses force him to mature, so when he is sent back by Zelda, he is no longer the young, naive child he was seven years ago. He cannot be. And when Navi flies away, that little statement about Hylians becoming Stalfos becomes relevant. For without Navi, Link as a Hylian can no longer return to the Kokiri forest without turning into a Stalfos. Hello there. Just as he can't return to the forest, he can no longer return to his childhood state. Navi flying away is symbolic of Link's own childhood being lost by being forced to grow up. Leaving Link, now effectively an adult in a child's body, unable to attain the childhood he lost, alone in a world that still considers him an outcast, unaware that in another timeline he is their saviour. After the credits, this leads to the last shot of the game, which is of child Link, no longer truly a child, meeting Zelda again for the first time, this time however, for the second time. And the same cutscene of their first meeting begins to play out as they turn to look at each other, before it fades to gold. This scene again was very poetic. As much as I wanted them to talk, talk about the future, and go on new adventures together, these possibilities lie just beyond a golden end screen. And in that way the ending was truly satisfying. It didn't give the players quite enough, but it froze the story with infinite potential, inviting the player to provide their own conclusion. In many ways it was a standard fantasy story, but so exceptionally well done, and for the first time in this medium. So you might be asking yourself the question, Albert, you f***ing biased piece of s***, what did you think when playing the game again to record this footage? Did you still enjoy it? My response to that would be, ouch, my feelings. And then I would think for a while, come back and say, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is the perfect game. It just is. It's my favourite Zelda game, and that's after having been blown away by the changes and improvements in Majora's Mask, and thinking the Dungeons and Skyward Sword were fantastic, and recently falling in love with the open world of Breath of the Wild and that Twilight Princess was another game I played. But to me, this game is still perfection. This game has its limitations, which are far more obvious to me as an adult with limited free time, like the tech speed does indeed suck testicles, extremely, slowly. The Water Temple, despite having no issues with it as a kid, made me sob internally as an adult, proving to myself that I am indeed becoming stupider with age. The world does not feel as big as it used to, and yet running around to do quests felt tedious this time like I had a task list to perform rather than just adventure and see what was in the next place. And that's because I already knew what was in the next place and what tasks I had to do there. Because I played this game religiously as a kid, I 100%ed it several times. I can never again play it for the first time. The time that hardwired incredible childhood memories single-handedly defined me as a gamer to this day. Since 1998, I've had many new experiences with new games that improved upon Ocarina of Time, or done new and better things. Dark Souls is a great example, and especially later Zelda games. And in light of these new experiences, certain parts of this game come across as aged, ancient. I guess that is the tragedy of nostalgia. And then there are parts of the game that, to me, haven't aged a single day. The world design is iconic and amazingly engaging in its details. The dungeon design is the best of any game that I've played. The bosses still impact me with their presence, and or scare me. The cinematic cutscenes still impress me and hit me with the feels and I dare you to find a game with more perfect final level, boss and ending. And despite how much I played it, I still find details that I never knew about, like how you can exit Lon Lon Ranch with a Pona by jumping the back fence, which I've never done until this playthrough. I've always jumped over Ingo's dumb head. Or how using ice arrows on Bongo Bongo's hands caused them to freeze and the player can see a unique animation of Bongo Bongo trying to punch his other hand out of the ice. Or Link's shadow disappearing in the water temple at the moment it separates to form Dark Link the guard that dies in Hyrule Castle Town right after Ganondorf comes through. Or how about Link's idle animation? If he wears iron boots, it changes the sound effect. There are YouTube channels like Luigi Bros with entire series dedicated to details in Ocarina of Time that most have missed. 
and other channels like The Obsessive Gamer, revealing huge amounts of beta content from the game's many stages of development. Like when the forest was an open stage, or when the medallions were equipable spells. Even to this day, I'm fascinated learning new things about this 24 year old game. And all of the game's limitations just fade away. And in fact, I am in awe of what they were able to achieve in 1998. I played the game in high definition in widescreen, which the original game didn't support, which is why in some of the footage, when the dungeon entrance symbol wasn't used in the minimap, it was stored here, off screen in the original game. It's why effects often don't reach the edge of the screen as well in this footage. And clipping and object culling often occurs in these boundaries. That's how optimized the game is. It really made me appreciate the smoke and mirrors of the original game. Even with its limited polygons and effects, and models not lining up correctly, and models not lining up correctly, I think about how everything looks so perfect back on a CRT television. And I mean this rain effect. Look at how simple it is, but it still felt so real to me. And in the year of our Lord 2020, the best way to play this game, I believe, is with a PC port, specifically the Ship of Harkinian, which has widescreen support, 1080p resolution, 60 frames per second for smoother animations, and modifiers to enhance tech speed, auto-equip tunics and boots with buttons. It fixes so many technical things while enhancing the appearance of the original game. Not to mention with support for future mods, enhanced effects like ray tracing and an inbuilt randomizer with item tracker. Despite the series name, there is only one Zelda game that is truly legendary. It is a factor of when it came out, as the first 3D Zelda on a new console, and before wide use of the internet and data mining, exploring every byte of data the game had to hold. And also how old I was at the time. This was literally the third game I played. I remember feverishly searching on Zelda fan sites for information on the game's secrets, seeing beta footage of the Horse Fountain and the room with the Triforce. In fact, this is one of the few Zelda games with the Triforce where the player doesn't actually acquire it, leading to numerous playground rumours on how you actually acquire the Triforce and have it here on your quest sub screen. Unlike other Zelda games where you just get the Triforce, a portion of it at a time, it just feels very underwhelming. Oh yay, a Triforce chunk, a golden nugget. But in Ocarina of Time you could just never get it and it felt so… legendary. In 2022 there was a Triforce percent run of the game done at Summer Games Done Quick, where a group of people used a robot to input hexadecimal code in a Nintendo 64 controller to essentially add DLC to the game, using beta assets on the cartridge as well as new assets programmed by them. And this DLC is basically a subquest to acquire three items representing wisdom, power and courage, including a humorous boss battle with a running man, before warping to the spiritual realm and with Shake's help, entering a room where you finally obtain the Triforce. And in this ending, Link gets to make a wish using the complete Triforce. He chooses to look to the future, before the game warps to the sky. Link now appearing as his Breath of the Wild transition. And he looks to the future, and with Zelda, look out at the messages of everyone watching the stream. Here together. Which is why I know that the following words I'll say are not only true for me, but for countless others. That even after all this time, my sense of wonder in this world, the sense of adventure and heroism, and the sadness and nostalgia I feel when the end screen appears, is exactly the same as when I was a child. It's a feeling I have not experienced in any other game. A feeling I have not experienced since I was 10, which was over two decades ago now. Who knows what other secrets are out there waiting to be discovered in the forgotten corners of the world. And that is why Ocarina of Time is my favourite game of all time. <laughs>